Now, if you would like to turn to Genesis 39, we're currently doing a series on Joseph. And I felt for a long time that we should do this series, and I was very excited about it. And then when I started, I got very nervous about it. But that's another story. We'll, we'll find out as we go on why. And so Genesis 39, we last week talked about how Joseph... Uh, was the favored son, and favoritism did him no favors at all. And it caused his brothers to hate him and to almost kill him. And then we talked about the parents' responsibility not to favor their children. Uh, even if there's something in your heart, you says, well, that one seems to stand out to me. You, you don't show it to all the other kids because it causes resentment. Uh, and then we talked about uh, how if you, endure, if you ignore certain things within children, uh, within anyone really, if you ignore things and if you become passive, even as a Christian, uh, not just as a parent, but in the church, if you start to say everything's okay, effectively later on you will endure what you ignore because things will go wrong and you'll suffer. And the saving grace that we ended with is that Potiphar bought Joseph, and that was the start of God taking him out of that place and put him into a place of prosperity for a while. And it's this whole idea that actually even when we ruin things, God rescues us from them because he loves us. So that's what you missed if you weren't here last week. So we're doing a series on the life of Joseph. And we start today with Joseph and Potiphar's wife. We'll read on from verse 1 in chapter 39. Now Joseph had been taken down to Egypt. Potiphar, an Egyptian, who was one of Pharaoh's officials, the captain of the guard, bought him from the Ishmaelites who had taken him there. The Lord was with Joseph so that he prospered, and he lived in the house of his Egyptian master. When his master saw that the Lord was with him and that the Lord gave him success in everything he did, Joseph found favor in his eyes and became his attendant. Potiphar put him in charge of his household, and he trusted him, trusted to his care everything he owned. From the time he put him in charge of his household and of all that he owned, the Lord blessed the household of the Egyptian because of Joseph. The blessing of the Lord was on everything Potiphar had, both on the house and in the field. So Potiphar left everything he had in Joseph's care, with Joseph in charge, he did not concern himself with anything except the food he ate. Now Joseph was well built and handsome, and I know how he feels. And after a while, his master's wife took notice of Joseph and said, Come to bed with me. But he refused. With me in charge, he told her, My master does not concern himself with anything in this house. Everything he owns, he has entrusted to my care. No one is greater in this house than I am. My master has withheld nothing from me except you, because you are his wife. How then could I do such a wicked thing and sin against God? And though she spoke to Joseph day after day, he refused to go to bed with her and even be with her. One day he went to the house to attend his duties, and none of his ho the household servants was inside. She caught him by his cloak and said, Come to bed with me. But he left his cloak in her hand and ran out of the house. When he saw that he had left his cloak in her hand and had run out of the house, when she saw that, she called her, her household servants. Look, she said to them, this Hebrew has been brought to make sport of us. He came in here to sleep with me, but I screamed. When he heard me scream for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. She kept his cloak beside her until his master came home. Then she told him this story. That Hebrew slave you brought us came to make sport of me. But as soon as I screamed for help, he left his cloak beside me and ran out of the house. When his master heard the story his wife had told him, saying, this is how your slave treated me, he burned with anger. Joseph's master took him and put him in prison, the place where the king's prisoners were confined. But while Joseph was there in prison, the Lord was with him. He showed him kindness and granted him favor in the eyes of the prison warden. So the warden put Joseph in charge of all those held in the prison, and he was made responsible for all that was done there. The warden paid no attention to anything under Joseph's care because the Lord was with Joseph and gave him success in whatever he did. 
Lord, we pray that you'll bring this and make this very relevant to us. In Jesus' name, amen. A number of years ago, a young lady came to me and said, I want to have a baby, and I'm struggling. Will you pray for me? So I prayed for this lady, and she became pregnant, and she had a baby, and the baby's well. A few years later, the same person came back to me, said, we want to have another baby, struggling again. Will you pray for us? And so I prayed for her, and within a few days, they'd conceived, and we celebrated. It was really exciting. A few weeks later, she'd lost a child and subsequently would never have children again. And the thing I want to start with today is if any Christian tells you that being a Christian means you don't have questions and you don't have disappointments, you tell them they're reading the wrong Bible. You tell them it's not true. Because Christians have disappointments and Christians have questions. And I questioned that week like anything. In fact, I avoided the person for about a month because I thought, what do I say? What do I say? Because that is the most damning experience you could ever hear of. And I said, God, why? Where are you? Joseph could have many questions, more questions if not, because he was told in a dream, as we saw last week, you will rule, and he was told twice, and to be told twice in his own, twice in his own words later on to Pharaoh is, if you hear a dream twice, then it's going to happen, because God has declared it. It's not going to be taken away. He has decided it will not change, and he had been told twice by God, you will rule over everyone, all of your brothers, including your parents, you will rule So he might be saying, well, God, you said I'd rule, but now I'm a slave. What is going on? Where are you? And I wonder if anyone in this room has ever had that experience. God has given you so many promises, and you've heard so many things and so many sermons, because we love to do those sermons where we say, God will give you it. God will do this. But we never hear enough sermons about what about when he doesn't? What about when he doesn't? And I think of Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who who gave us the right quotes for a Christian life. He says, when Christ calls a man, and he includes women as well, when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. He bids him come and die. We don't hear many sermons on that nowadays. But when Christ calls a man, he bids him come and die. And what he means is that the Christian life is a sacrificial life. It's not an easy life. The people in the world might be looking on the church saying, well, they're just in some holy bubble and they think everything's going well. And even when it doesn't go well, they pretend it is going well. Because we always hear that, don't we? Don't fear this. Don't do that. You mustn't think like that. Oh, yeah, no, if you say it, it will happen to you. However, it's easy in the West to say things like that. But when you are in a country like Syria and you're being killed and all those things are going well, it's much harder to say that, although you can find prosperity in those places too. But it's usually a prosperity of the heart. He bids you come and die. But it doesn't end there. 2 Timothy says, if we die with him, we will also live with him. If we endure, we will also reign with him. You see, there is a promise as well that if we persevere in this time and we sacrifice in this life and if we stand firm against all that will come against us in a foreign land, then in the end we will stand before Christ and in the end he will wipe away every tear and in the end he will take away all mourning and disease and sickness and in the end we will stand and we will worship God freely knowing there is no dangers. In the end that will happen because in the end the old order of things would have passed away. But for now, it's difficult, and Joseph knew it. We have a life of sacrifice, although God will be with us in that sacrifice, which is the first thing that we learn from Joseph. In the first two verses, we hear that Joseph is there and taken to Potiphar, and we get to verse 2, and it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and so he prospered. And so he prospered, and the Lord was with him. And you have to ask questions. Does he look like a prospering Christian when he's in slavery? Does he look like a prosperous Christian when he has been rejected by his family, almost killed and thrown in a well and sold by his own brothers? Does he look like a prospering Christian? Do any of you ever have those moments in your life where you say, is God even there? Are you one of those Christians that's able to recite the Bible left, right, and center and pretend that nothing ever goes wrong in your life and when it does go wrong, you just say, it's not going wrong because if I accept it's going wrong, then, then, then the magic's going to wear off or something? You know, I've met loads of those Christians, but that doesn't seem to be the case here. Is God even real? Because things are going wrong. Things are going wrong. 
Years ago, I, was, I went through a four-year depression stage, and it was deep. You know, it wasn't one of these, I'm just feeling a little bit down today. It was like, if I could take my life, I would. And it was a really interesting time because I went through this time, and then the previous pastor here, the previous associate pastor, Johnny Pozzo, who's a great friend of mine and many in this room, would come to see me at lunchtime in Crawley. He would come over on his moped, and uh, he would sit down at lunch, and I would reveal to him why I was so depressed, and I revealed to him that my thought pattern in my head was so full of evil. I mean, I just started to believe I was this evil person because I kept thinking of evil things. It's like if you say to yourself, don't think of a blue elephant, what do you think of? Everyone thinking of a blue elephant right now? And that's what I was going through. And anything I would see on TV, I would say, that's me. That's me. Don't think about it. Now I'm thinking about it. And it would go on. And I would just sink into this horrible pit that said, God, if you're there, help me. And for four years, there was no help. And then many years later, I came across this time where God did something so big in me and and released me so much that I, I was called into ministry And John Bridger, the previous pastor here, said, I think you need to go and see Johnny Pozzo and tell him that you're going to become a pastor and see what he says about it. You know, see if you can get some confirmation out of him. You know, try and string it out a little bit. And so I drove all the way to New Malden. I sat down with Johnny and I said to him, Johnny, uh, I'm thinking of becoming a pastor. And he said, I'm not surprised. God's hand has been all over you for all these years. I've seen it. And I thought to myself, how on earth can you see God's hand on someone? when they revealed such evil thoughts from their head to you, their thought pattern and the way that I used to be and the way I used to think, how can you, I used to reveal the most deepest thing. He said, but God's hand was all over you. That's Joseph's story. It's even greater than the one that I have. He was a wealthy, privileged boy and the favor in it because if you look back from Abraham to Isaac and down to to Jacob, you will find that there was this inheritance that ran through the line. There was lots of animals and lots of wealth passed down. So he was in a wealthy family and suddenly he's a slave. Suddenly he's gone from up here to down here. He was not prospering now he come from a prosperous family. Everything was really good for him. And suddenly, he's lost everything. But in verse 2, it says, The Lord was with Joseph, and he prospered. You think about that for a moment. You know, you're a Christian, and everything tumbles down. Your family leave you. You lose your identity. Everything is all gone. And it said, and, and someone comes to you and says, I can see the hand of the Lord all over you. You'd say, well, smite me, almighty smiter, wouldn't you? You'd be like, great, he's already done it. This is really not going well for me. But he didn't just lose. You know, I, I whinge when I don't get a car parking space in Morrison's. Anyone do that? And it seems like for all the love in the world, if I pray there's no spaces, if my daughter prays, all these cars move. And it's like, what, what about me, Lord? I've been waiting for you for years. Where are you? But I'm moaning about parking spaces, or, or you know, some of us moan about little things, but what we got here with Joseph is he, he loses his family and his home, he loses his identity, he loses his, his, his freedom, he loses his brothers, everything, his self-respect. Yet apparently, he's prospering, and apparently, the God's hand is all over him. And you know, he must actually be all over him because Potiphar could have killed him. I mean, I don't know about you. If someone went and had their way with my wife, I I would have to think very, very long and hard about how I deal with that. And as a Christian, you couldn't go and deal with it harshly. But, you know, Potiphar wasn't. And he had the the, the power to kill Joseph, and he didn't. Now, why didn't he? Is it because he knew that his wife was a bit funny and, and liked to get it on with people? Did he know that she wasn't trustworthy? Or did he see God's hand all over Joseph? That even in the worst place in the world, Joseph looked like he was prospering. He was with the Lord even when things were going wrong. You know he would have been, according to historical evidence, he would have been taken into Egypt, into his foreign land. He would have been taken into a marketplace. They would have stripped his clothes off so he's naked so everyone could see what they're getting, everything, the whole lot. And they would have just stood him up there, favored son, prospered family, in the line of God, in the line of Jesus, standing there naked in a foreign land. Who will buy me? Who will buy me? Can you imagine that? Does it sound like God is with this man and he's standing there and he's got this going on? Why? Is the question. Why do God's people have to suffer? Why did Joseph have to go through this heartbreaking, humiliating journey? Well, it's the same reason Jesus hung on the cross, isn't it? And he shouted out. He said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? me. 
as he hung and he bled and he was hanging on that cross. He said, why God? Why is this happening to me? And the answer is that someone has to pay the price so that many others will go free. That in this sinful world, and, and Joseph's brothers have committed the most incredible sin, someone had to pay the price so that they went free. Joseph paid a price so that his brothers could one day go free. Jesus paid the price and suffered so that we might one day be called his brothers and sisters. That's why suffering is all over this world. It's about setting people free. But the question is, if Jesus hung on the cross and done what he did, and if Joseph did what he did, why is it that we as Christians still need to suffer today? Why do we go through hard times? Why are we struggling? And the answer is simple. Ephesians 6. It says that our battle is not of flesh and blood but of the principalities. It's about the evil, dark world that we live in. We don't live in heaven. Joseph was in a foreign land. You are in a foreign land. This is not your eternal home. The people you see around you may be your eternal people, but they may not be. And you're in a foreign land, and the suffering is coming. You know, when you choose Jesus, and Rose, this is for you, when you choose Jesus, you go, you're in this battle, you join this battle, and you go from being neutral in the battle to being an ally with God. And when you become from neutral to an ally, you become a target for the enemy. And that's why there's, there's Christians all over the world being persecuted. That's why there's Christians being, uh, having their heads chopped off and their hands chopped off and their, their legs chopped off. And we're running around saying, oh, well, I'm just upset I didn't get a parking space. We live in a foreign land. And we're in a battle. And we're no longer neutral. But we don't have to fear. Does everyone remember the story in Daniel of uh, Radshap, Meshap, and Abednego? Remember that one? And they go into the fiery furnace, and they're in there. Did they burn? Why did they not burn? Could someone tell me, please? Because God was with them. And you know, when Daniel was placed in the lion's den, did he, did he get eaten? Why did he not get eaten? Because God was with him. You know, when you look at their stories, you think, how could God allow them to be thrown in a fiery furnace? The answer is this. God doesn't remove his people from the battle. He stands with them in the battle. He doesn't say that you'll never have struggles. He says, you'll never struggle without me. I'll ensure that you persevere. I'll ensure you get to the end. But you won't have a gold parking space if you're a pastor. You won't have a great big stretch living scene. And I'm so gutted about that, but it won't happen. It won't happen. But he says, I will stand with you when you don't get those things. And I will stand with you when you struggle and when things are going all so wrong in your life. God is with us. And so as Jesus hung on the cross, he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He dies. And as he says those words and he commits his spirit, then there's the Roman that placed him on there saying, actually, I think this man might be righteous after all. Because when everything seemed to have gone wrong and God had left him, suddenly the ground began to shake and darkness came over the land. And then the temple curtain tore in two. And suddenly, there's an earthquake. And suddenly, it, they realized that God was there all along. He couldn't intervene, but he was able to work with Jesus to make sure that he could make it. God is there. God is with us. He will never leave us. He was with you all along, even when your struggles. And sometimes that is hard to hear. But he'll make sure you make it. And I was asking this question about God being with me this week. I, 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 there's a guy in the community that I really like, and I've been trying to work with him for a while. And, and we've been talking a lot about God, and he's been coming to a little bits here and there at the church. And I, was, I, I said, look, why don't we go out for a pint, and we'll have a chat, and we'll, we'll talk stuff, and God stuff as well. And we sat there, and I'm sitting there, and I'm listening to this person, and telling him about life, and I'm sitting there saying, God, give me a door. Give me a door into this man's heart. Give me an opportunity. And I'm sitting there, and every, every two minutes I'm saying, well, what about God then? You know? And then we move off to another, so well, what about more God? Then? And we just keep dropping it in there. And I'm like, God, are you with me? And all of a sudden I'm sitting there thinking, oh, this, is, this, this evangelism thing is hard, God. If you're not going to come, then no one's going to help me. I, I can't do it. And all of a sudden, the guy turned to me and said, do you know what, Mike? Something weird did happen the other night. I said, what's that? He said, I left the pub. I was walking home, and he said, as I got to the church, I glanced at it, 
And I had this overwhelming peace fly through me like I've never had in my life before. He said, the sense of peace I've never experienced. He said, I think there's something in this God thing. God is with us. God is with us. God is moving. God's Holy Spirit is doing a great work. Even when it seems that things aren't working out for you, he's there. But you need to beware. The next thing you need to know is that Joseph realized that you need to beware because he's not the only one that's with you. God is not the only one with you. There is also someone else with you. You see, when he was at his prosperous best, the temptation came his way. When everything started to turn and it was going well, you know, when your business starts turning and going well, hallelujah, God, and then suddenly something goes wrong. You're like, where were you? You know, he was there five minutes ago. He's gone now. You know, he, he had his best at the prosperous best. Then he has a visit from temptation. Right at that good moment when nothing else could go wrong, surely. And it says that he was handsome and of good build. And Potiphar's wife took notice of him. And she said, come to bed with me. Come to bed with me. Sleep with me. And he refuses. And he says that my master has put everything in this house under my control. I can have anything, but I can't have you. Is anyone getting deja vu right now? Anyone getting deja vu? I'm not saying that you're all having an affair or something. What I mean is, you know, when you look back into Genesis and Eve is there and she says, we can have any fruit of any tree, but we can't have the fruit of the the knowledge of good and evil. We can't have that one thing. We can have anything. God says you can have anything. You just can't have that one thing. In comes. They're at their prosperous best, walking with God, got everything they want, and in comes a visit from temptation. The devil comes in. It's the same story in a different mode. It's repeated throughout the whole Bible, and we got it here, and suddenly the tempter comes in and says, did God really say that? And you've heard it all before, that when you're with it, you know, I can only speak for a man because I don't know how women tick, really. I don't think anyone else does. But, um, <laughs> but think of it like this. I'm a man, and I can tell you that I have been in the presence of many beautiful women. And I can't lie to you and say I haven't you know, stood there and gone, whoa, she's good looking. I have. Shoot me now, you holy righteous people. <laughs> but make sure with the same measure that you judge me that you will be judged, right? We need to be honest about these things, otherwise we will never, ever, ever avoid temptation. I've had it. I've had it. I've been tempted. And I've been victorious because God is with me. He is with me. And this is the story we have here. We get this temptation right there. And when does she tempt him? Right when he's alone. When was Jesus tempted? In the wilderness. When he's at his prosperous best with the Holy Spirit. He's been filled with the Spirit. He's led out into the desert. And there he is tempted. Where does he tempt, where does he tempt Joseph? He tempts him when everyone else is outside the house. And he's just there all alone. When will he get us? When we are alone and we think everything is going well, that's the best place to get us because we're not expecting it. We're not guarding ourselves. We are in a spiritual battle. And that battle is as big today as it ever has done. We are not in limbo waiting for Jesus to turn up and come and take us. And there's one thing you need to know about a spiritual battle is that you need to hold on to the plan that God has promised for your life. That in that plan there will be suffering. And that plan is this, there's twofold. First of all, that you will be saved. If you don't know Jesus here today, he wants you to know him. And just think about this for one minute. I came for nothing. I'm going to nothing according to what the world tells me. So what am I? Do you want to be insignificant and nothing? Or do you want to think, actually, why is all this here? I sit in my bedroom at times thinking, why is all this here? Why did I appear in the universe? You know, I know science says that like, this great big accident happened or something, and all these little things came together, and here I am, and now I'm making cars, and I'm driving this. That's just, do you know, when people say that Christians like, believe in fairies, that sounds even worse. Nothing existed, and now it does. Oh, that sounds like a really good theory. The first thing is that God wants you to get saved. And when you are saved, the second thing is he wants you to spend the rest of your life saving others in his power for his glory. He wants you to partner with him. They're the two things. But there are two things that stand in the way. The first is the devil. And the second is you. We often like to blame the devil, don't we? Oh, it's all his fault. Oh, that devil. I'll stamp him out. I will. I'll get him. I will. It's like, well, what about you? You're just as weak and, and, and you know, are you growing in the Lord? Are you, are, you, are you praying? Are you asking the Lord? 
You know, you're going to blame him for everything? Because that's an easy get out of jail card, isn't it? Oh, yeah, so I killed someone because the devil told me to. That's nuts. And people do that. Oh, I had an affair because the devil got me. Grow some. Be a Christian. Be a real Christian. God is with us in the battle. Luke 10, 19 says, See, I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. We have been promised the authority for the victory. We've been promised it. When we sit back saying, oh, no, he's got me this time, it's like, you don't know what arsenal you have. You've got the God of your universe standing behind you saying, I'll give you a gift. I'll give you the power. I'll give you authority. Oh, no, but he won today, Lord. No, he didn't. You let him win. Stand firm. Even when it's going hard, stand firm. And even when it feels like you are just losing the battle, stand firm. I remember one day when I was a, <laughs> I was a young, immature, well, slightly more immature than now, and I was asked to give this, this woman a lift to meetings. And I've got to be honest, she was stunning. And I was single, you know. And you put those things together, you get a, a, like a rabbit as a young man. You, you're just overexcited. And so I'm giving this woman a lift uh, to, to places. And uh, yeah, a really good looking girl. And I've told my wife about this story, so she knows. And so... <laughs> So what happened was I was given a lift home, you know, to and fro, and, and I, I started to get an inkling that actually she might like me. And I prayed. I thought, well, God, you know, I've come a bit further in my faith now, and I don't, I don't want this. The woman was married but separated. And, and I was sitting there one day in a car, totally unexpected, and this woman turns to me, well, how would you feel about going out with an older woman? And I'm thinking, in the flesh, I'm there tomorrow. <laughs> I'm all yours, baby. And, uh, <laughs> but I would prayed, and... And I knew that this, this marital certificate, why separated and not divorced, I knew, I knew that this woman was still another man's property. And so I had two things, and I started with the worst thing you could ever start with. She said, well, why not? I said, first of all, you're too old. Don't start there, all right? Really bad place. But then I said... But you're also married. No, no, we're separate. No, you're also married. You have a certificate, you're married. You are, you are, you know, I know it's not all about a certificate, but for me, in the eyes of God, this is a big thing for me to turn down, and I did it. And what I'm, what I'm trying to say is that the tempter will come after all of us. And I remember sitting in my MR2, and I didn't know that the little round button lets the air out so that the windows don't you know, steam up. So I'm sitting with this really awkward conversation, windows steamed. Next thing I know, clonk. I'm like, what's that? A book has arrived on my windscreen. And I'm looking out going, what's that? And it said, anger management. The husband who apparently didn't love her anymore was really angry. He'd put a book on my screen to let me know about it. I said, look, love, you've got to go. I think this guy thinks there's something going on between us, and it really isn't. You need to get out of my car right now. But I want to say to you, you're going to get tempted. And too often I hear Christians say, I gave in. Oh, I gave in, he got me. And on that day, I was able to say, as a young man with really no responsibilities, I was able to say no. Joseph made righteous choices. Righteous, the difference between right and wrong. He made righteous choices. And making righteous choices is hard. But when you do it, and when he did it, he depowered Satan. And he conquered his own weaknesses. And we have to be people that want to do that. Joseph said, how could I do such a wicked thing against God? How did he do it? He first of all valued God above anything else in his life. Even the pretty woman in a car. Verse 10 says, although she spoke to him day after day, Joseph refused to go to bed with her or even be with her. How many of us need to make sure that we don't put ourselves in temptation's way? How many of us spend our time with good-looking women on our own without our partners? How many of us think that it doesn't matter? It doesn't matter if I, if I sleep with that woman uh, or, or, or because I'm single. And it doesn't matter if she's, got a, a, she's married in some way, but she's given up on that guy. It's okay. It's okay for me because I'm the single one. It's not. It doesn't make other people stumble. But you must do two things. And that is, one, put God above everything you have and everything you are. And even say to in every situation, will God be pleased with this? How could I do such a sick and disgusting, evil thing against my God? And secondly, remove yourself from those situations. And finally, what do you do when it appears that the enemy 
is winning. I don't know about you, I've had many situations like that. Joseph is here. He does everything right, and yet everything goes wrong. Does anyone feel like that today? Like you're trying to do the right thing. You come to church on a Sunday, you pray, you go to your men's and women's groups, and you do all the things that you can, and just everything seems to be crumbling around you like the, the enemy is winning. Perhaps you had a promise from God. You were going to be some great prophet or some great preacher or I don't know. You know, It's always something like that, isn't it? It's never like you're going to sweep the streets for the Lord. It's always like, no, you're going to speak in front of thousands. Maybe you're in that place right now. You're saying, God, where are you? It all seems to be going wrong. Perhaps you're living under shattered dreams right now. Everything's shattered. Your dreams are shattered. Everything has gone wrong. Disappointed with God. I know how that feels. Anyone seen that film, Infinity War? Marvel film? That thing almost made me cry. I'm in the cinema, the good guys die. And I'm sitting there thinking, I want my money back. Do you think Joseph might have been sitting there thinking, I want my money back? Give me back my robe with all the colors. I'll I'll be quiet from now on. You know, sorry, they spilt blood on it. You'll have to get a new one. You know, do you ever feel like everything is going wrong when you're doing everything that you think is right? He could have given up. He could have have just just gone away and just thought, I'm not going to follow God. But you know what happened? His character shone in the darkness. Everywhere he went, even the prison warden was like, I'm going to put you in charge. Potiphar put him in charge of everything in his house. But even when it all went wrong, he shone and he continued. Why did he do that? How did he do that? How did he continue to prosper when everything was going wrong? Well, I can tell you, it goes right back to the beginning. God gave him a dream and he believed on God's dream more than he believed in his circumstances. He believed that God's promises were greater than his problems. Joseph kept going even when things were hard. Joseph continued and continued and continued to push the doors of God. If the band want to come back. I've, I had a story like this many years ago. My mom and my sister didn't speak for 12 years. Can you imagine that? You have a daughter that doesn't speak to you for 12 years. Some of you are going, hmm, could be nice. It's not. It's really not a nice story. It was a horrible, horrible story. And my mum went to a prayer group of what I can only describe as nutty Christians, the ones that pray all exciting prophetic things. And this woman said to her, I see a picture. And the picture is of you. And there's your, your daughter here and you here. And this great big wall that's been put put up between you. And she says, I see the wall coming down brick by brick and God saying, I'm going to bring you back together. I can tell you as the sun looking in, that was impossible to get those girls back together. I tried really hard-ish. And, uh, but they were, they were having a horrid time. They almost hated each other. Well, my mum not so much. Sister was a little bit down that line. And so she said, I'm going to bring the wall down. And you know, 12 years, my mum went to church. My mum prayed. My mum served. My mum kept telling me God is good, which I was sitting there thinking, yeah, okay, now you're starting to sound like Joseph. But you know what happened? Enjoy your coffee with your daughter this week, mum? You're even here, mum. There she is. You had coffee this week, right? She has coffee every week with with her daughter. You've got to believe that God's promises are greater than your problems. Because that's what the Bible calls us to believe. You've got to discard those Christians that run around saying, I've got a cold. Don't say you've got a cold. You can't have a cold. Don't say it or you'll get it. That's nonsense. Yes, I know words are powerful. Strike me down, oh holy charismatic lot. I'm charismatic, but I'm not a nut job. We get ill. We get, I've had colds. All right? But believe that God is still with you when you've got a cold. It's not unclean, unclean. Jesus healed the leper. He wasn't scared of it. Stop lying to yourselves and accept that we will have good days, we'll have bad days. But when everything is falling down around you, believe that God's promises are greater than your problems. That's where we want to go.